I decided to make a schedule that shows what assignments are due every day just so people can keep track of things. Keep in mind with lab, like tomorrow we have lab. So you have a pre-lab quiz that's always going to be due five minutes before lab starts. It's on Moodle, so you go to Moodle. This will be your first pre-lab quiz, so it's important that I let you know now. Go to Moodle and you'll find, if you look at the calendar, it'll be linked there. If you look in the upcoming, it'll be linked there. If you look down in Chapter 2, it'll be linked there. So there's multiple places you can find it on Moodle. But there's a pre-lab quiz due before lab. So it's due by five minutes before lab. And then, of course, when is the lab due? The lab write-up? Thursday. Thursday before, well, five minutes before midnight. Because if I put it midnight, then it looks like it's Friday, and I don't want it to be confusing. Um, so you have two assignments with the, or two things with each lab, the pre-lab quiz and then turning in the actual lab report. So today being Monday, you have the reading quiz that was due before class. You'll have the homework due 11.55 tonight. And you can follow through this just on the assignments that are due throughout the semester. So that's in the schedule. There's just now two things in the schedule. There's the normal course schedule and then just the assignment schedule. Um, on the, um, the OneNote page. Um, I invited everyone, if you didn't get the invitation or you use a different account, just on Moodle, click the link for OneNote, and then there's something there for you to request permission. Um, a number of students, I know Ed was the first one. Where did you find the thing to request permission for this class? Yeah, you click it, it says request permission, okay. That's also where things like my lecture stuff are. And homework stuff, when students come for help with homework, I do them on this so it's available to anyone what I did to help students with homework. Okay, so getting start with started with today's lecture. Now in lab tomorrow, we're gonna to be exclusively studying the graphing motion. But I want to at least introduce it here so it's not the first time you've seen it in lab. And of course, these figures are from the book, and I just used, well, it's actually the highlighter pen in black. I highlighted it in black to take out the graph so it doesn't just show you the answers. We start with our graphing. Why do we make things in graphs? Why do we do graphs a lot in physics? Because we do them a lot in physics. Why do you think we use graphs a lot in physics? To measure speed or distance? Um, that's a thing that we do from them, but why do we use graphs? Okay, for visual recognition of the data. We want to, when you look at a graph, if you understand the graph, not only is it recording the, the information, like Ashley said, but you can then quickly interpret other things from it. And so if we understand how to read and use a graph effectively, it's much more useful than having a table of numbers. You know, table of numbers, you know, I do want them in tables so you have a glance factor. You can look and see for, you know, look for inconsistencies and stuff. But the graph makes things a lot clearer. And so for understanding graphs, we start with the definitions that we've already learned, that the average velocity is delta x over delta t, and the average acceleration is delta v over delta t. Now, I wrote these as vector equations. Our graphs are going to be one-dimensional, right? We're only going to have motion in the x direction. We're not going to have motion in three directions. We're not going to have to worry about... It went this much north, this much east, and this much up. And so in practicality, we're going to be using these as scalar equations. V average equals delta x over delta t. So the first type of graph we make for motion is a position versus time graph. So if you look at this graph, tell me what kind of motion is represented in this graph. What happened to the object? It starts at position zero, right? And then what does it do? Okay, we have accelerates. What does acceleration mean? A rate of change in velocity. So she said it accelerates. Does it accelerate forward or backward?
Did I have the answers? I didn't. Here. Forward. Okay, by convention, we use positive as the forward direction. So we have forward. Now, it moves for a while forward. What does it do at something like 0.25 seconds or 0.25 hours? Okay, it changes direction. It was going forward, and then all of a sudden it's going backward. Now, we, we had the word accelerate. I want to come back to our equation here. Our average velocity is delta x over delta t, or average speed if it's one-dimensional. So in this case, if I look at this, I can say, well, that's a straight line. And for a straight line, I can find... That did not draw. There we go. I can find the slope of the straight line. And if I find the slope of that line, what's the equation to find the slope? Slope is rise over run. So now if we look at the graph, the rise is going to be the change in position. Well, what's our physics symbol for change in position? Delta x. So the rise is delta x. And what is the run there going to be? It's the chime. So that's going to be delta t. But what is delta x over delta t? The velocity. Now, in this case, I put without a vector sign, so that means speed. But as... A student already saw this morning, I use the terms interchangeably. It's not correct, but I do. So speed or velocity, depending on if it's a vector or not. I must have erased a stroke there or something. <laughs> Got a couple strokes missing from there. Let's not worry about it. So our average speed is the slope. Now, is the slope changing here? From 0 to 2.25 hours? From 0 to 0.25, it's not changing. It's a constant slope. So if the slope is constant from 0 to 0.25 hours, what does that mean about the speed? It's constant. And if the speed is constant, then the change in speed is, well, it is constant, but it's constant at 0. Right? If the speed is constant, then the change in speed is 0. And so acceleration, the word we started with, Acceleration, and I know one student wanted to correct me right off the bat. Acceleration is the rate at which the speed is changing. And so during that time from 0 to 0.25, the speed was constant. What do we know about the speed before 0? Nothing. So it very well could have accelerated. You know, we would assume it was stationary before we started, and then suddenly it started going forward. So there would have been a massive acceleration right there at time equals 0. But that's an assumption. We don't have the data to say yay nor nay. What about what's going on at 0.25 hours? You had a positive slope, and then you changed to a negative slope. What does that mean when we talk about motion? You change direction. So it had a positive speed to a negative speed. A positive velocity or positive speed means in the positive direction for one dimensional motion, so it really is a vector. The negative is changing direction to the opposite. So it changed direction. So what we have here, we can now say quite clearly, something moved forward with the speed of, and if you look at the numbers there, it's six kilometers per 0.25, six times four is 24. 24 kilometers per hour for a quarter of an hour. And then it instantly changed direction and came back at the same speed. So I can describe the motion very accurately from looking at that. And based on our calculations, you, hopefully you all understood my math there. Delta X, the X final was six kilometers. The X initial was zero. Delta T was 0.25 hours minus zero. So the speed there was 24 kilometers per hour going out, same speed coming back, just opposite. So if we make a graph of the, the velocity versus time, it says velocity, because even though we're limiting ourselves to one direction, 
the signs tell us which direction if it's going in the positive or negative direction. So that's why velocity is an accurate term here. So let's draw on this and then erase the, the blackout. What should my velocity versus trying graph look like? Straight line. <laughs> Straight line. And then the negative of that. And then the negative of that. Now notice the units here are in kilometers per hour, and either I did my math horribly bad, which I can't imagine. Really, 0.25 is one fourth, right? Mm -hmm. So six divided by one fourth. Should be six times four, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Should be 24. I mean, I, I can't imagine that I have these numbers wrong. Well, what's going on at this time right here at 0.25? Hot tip, it's not possible. What happens at that single point in time? Yeah, you change direction instantly, which means you have an infinite acceleration. If we look up here at the acceleration, acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. If the velocity changes from 24 to minus 24 in zero time, then our acceleration is going to be final, minus 24, minus initial, minus 24, so that's minus 48 on top divided by zero. And minus 48 divided by zero is a mathematical error. How do we show that on a graph? With a vertical line. So we can interpret what the graph is going to look like simply by using what we know about the equations for motion. And so, yeah, I missed on this one line, but we nailed it. What about speed versus time? Velocity versus time, we've got. What about speed versus time? How is that going to compare to velocity versus time? I'm going to be zero. It's going to be constant all the way. Why is it constant all the way? Because the speed is just how fast you're traveling. It doesn't matter if you're going forward, backward, sideways. It's just how big the number is. It's just the magnitude. And so since the magnitude was the same all the way across, then it will be constant. And I see they have that as 12. I still can't see my way clear to say that 6 times 4 is 12. If somebody wants to show me the error of my ways, you know, like maybe I misinterpret something, feel free to do so because I hate being wrong, and especially being teaching you wrong. So if you see a way to make them correct and me wrong, feel free to let me know. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, what about this one? This graph shows motion. What kind of motion did we have for a constant velocity? Straight line. Where do we have a straight line here? Do we have a straight line ever? I would say it's a straight line going from there to there. Perfect straight line that I just drew. As you can tell. And so I would say that it's constant velocity there from about 15 seconds until about 40 seconds. What's going on before 15 seconds? Okay, we have acceleration. How can you read that and know it's accelerating? What's happening to the slope? It's changing. If it's changing, you have an acceleration because if you have a changing slope, that means you have a changing velocity. Now the slope is changing from horizontal to partially upward. So is the speed going up or down? Up. So that's a positive acceleration. Then we have constant velocity in this region that I've covered with green. If it's constant velocity, what's the acceleration? Zero. And then what's going on with the speed going from 40 seconds on? Okay, it's flattening out, which means that the acceleration is negative, deceleration. And so the acceleration is going to be going, not like that, oops, like that, ha! I erased more than I wanted to. 
it's starting off with a positive acceleration, then goes down to zero for that center portion, and then goes to a negative acceleration for the last portion. And what would the velocity graph look like? What's the velocity doing from here to, well, according to their work, from here to here, the velocity is changing. What's it doing there? We said it's increasing in speed. So the velocity is going up, then it reaches a constant value, and then it comes down. So it should look something like that. Okay, mine is not very accurate there, but it has the right general shape. So just by looking at one graph, we can get a lot of information about not just the position, but also the velocity or the acceleration. And of course, if you can go from a position graph to a velocity graph to an acceleration graph, you should be able to work your way back as well. It's a little more difficult working your way back as well. Um, if you start with the acceleration graph, it doesn't tell you what the speed was initially. So it could start at any speed if you start with the acceleration graph. And likewise, it doesn't tell you the initial position. So you have some things you just say, well, let's assume it starts at a speed of zero because the graph doesn't tell me that. Right? So it's not as perfect going back. Any questions about this interpretation of graphs? Yeah, Gila. Is it time that has to be constant, or can the position be constant all the time? Um, I need more context for the question. Like, um, if you know something is moving at a constant 50 kilometers. Per hour, or per. But you don't know if it's like, if, but the time, the seconds change. Well, in, in order to have a graph, you have to have change in at least one variable, and then you can calculate delta x over delta t or whatever. And so if you have no change in time, that means you have a division by zero error, and you have infinity. right? So if we have like the position discontinuously changes, it goes from zero to 10 kilometers in no time, that would be an infinite speed. So we're going to have to have changing time to have non-infinite values. Is that, is that what you were asking about? Yes. Leslie. So I understand the part where it's like, okay, well, you know, the acceleration is like, well, the velocity is like going up and up and up, and the acceleration is pretty like, you know, it's going up, it's constant, and then it just drops, and then it goes like, it's like, constant again, I guess you can see, and then it drops again. Like, I'm not... Okay. So you're talking about this graph here? The acceleration graph. Okay, this one here. Okay, so from 0 to 20, the slope is getting steeper. So that means the acceleration is positive. Now, from my just visual observation skills, I can't tell you if it's a constant acceleration. I can only say it's positive. So for me, looking at this graph... I might have just as easily had something that went like this for the acceleration there because I can't try and assemble, come over so I can see your face because I can't tell exactly what the acceleration is from that. Now, if I analyze the data, I'll be able to determine it. You know, like if I use a curve fit or something, but just looking at it, I can't tell. And so I just know it's positive because the curvature is upward. So because it's positive, it's just because it's going straight. So you say it's positive. So it's like well, no, I'm talking about this portion here is positive. Oh, yeah. This portion here, because it's going straight, that means the slope, the V, is constant. Yeah. And so if the V is constant, the change in V is zero. And so the acceleration has to be zero if the position line is a straight line. So because acceleration is zero, it just goes straight? So... Then this one here is horizontal because, and this one here is zero because it was a straight position line. So a straight position line, no matter what the slope, is going to result in a horizontal velocity line and a zero for the acceleration. How do you know where to put it? Where to put the, which? Like how, how long are you starting on point four and then it's just constant? Like how do you know where to put it? Okay, this here, that, that's what I said. I can't determine that just by looking. I would actually have to take some numbers and calculate. Right. So then, I mean, then it drops because of the fact that then 
uh, I, I can see it from the position versus time graph, but then it goes constant again and then it drops again. Right, the, the constant in the middle, we know that's a constant zero because the velocity is not changing. The slope is constant on my position line. And then the curvature here is curving down on the last portion, which tells me that it's gotta be negative here. It doesn't, ha it doesn't tell me the value without doing careful fitting, but it tells me it's gotta be negative. All right, moving to our first clicker question of the day, and also our only clicker question of the day. Make sure you answer. <laughs> what? Or when is the object accelerating? That is, when is the acceleration not zero? And remember, it's Clicker Channel 33 or Session ID WebFizz. I have it. Mm -hmm. I, it lets me sign in through Moodle. Mm -hmm. um, how what, once you've done that, then you just open up the app here. Or open up the app on your phone. Okay. You only so, have to sign through Moodle once. Okay. So... So, not move. You want to go to the turning. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that. And then you're going to put in session ID web fizz after you log. Ed. Oh, yes, deceleration is acceleration not equal to zero. That's correct. Okay. Got nice in there with, with the alternate name. Ashley's not in yet. Corsa's not in yet. There's Corsa. So we're still missing Peter. Ashley and Irving. It, well, okay. One person is in and it didn't register, so that could be you. Okay, moving on in five seconds here. Our answers here were stop, hammer time. Um, we had 25 people that said always except from 20 to 40 and three people that said only from 40 to 50. So the person who's going to explain this to all is James Dickerson. So I put B because uh, in that current state between 20 to 40 seconds, that he's at a steady state of acceleration, even though the position is changing, the is not, therefore it's not accelerated. Okay, you said steady acceleration, that's true, but Yes, that's, it's true when you say steady acceleration, but that's a steady acceleration at zero. What we wanted was the steady velocity, which tells us. So that's right. It was a steady velocity there. So that's when you had an acceleration of zero. Everywhere else, the velocity was changing. Um, James, what's the key to tell you the velocity is changing? It's when there's not a straight line. Yeah, when the slope is changing, then it's accelerating. So it was accelerating here and here. Okay, great. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. Back to kinematic equations. The things we need to do the homework problems today. The kinematic equations, I didn't have time to get very far into them at all last class period. Now we'll get into them and have to solve problems. So we start for the kinematic equations. Kinematic means motion. Kinematic are the equations that describe motion. And so the, the equations that describe motion start with these two equations that we were just using when we were looking at the graphical analysis and that we introduced earlier. They define what velocity average and acceleration average are. Now we are going to take, for physics 151, you're always going to have constant acceleration. Why? because you don't have calculus. People in physics 251, you'll have changing acceleration. You'll have jerks in your life. But people in physics 151, no jerk. Constant acceleration. And so 
we'll take off the A average for the physics 151 and just say acceleration is changing velocity over changing time, or changing speed over changing time if you're working in one dimension. And then the second one there is if you have a constant acceleration, then that means your speed will be changing in a linear fashion and the average speed will be halfway between the starting and ending speeds. Now that's only true if you have a constant acceleration. And so the, the lower equation is only true for constant acceleration. And then by combining those two, we can say, well, let's take the top equation, the V average is equal to delta X over delta T. If I solve that for delta X, I have delta X is V average multiplied by delta T. So if I want to find out how far something traveled and I know its average speed, I just take that average speed multiplied by the time it traveled. Simple enough. Well, I'm going to expand this a little bit. Delta X is X final minus X initial. And delta T We time, you just decide when you're going to start timing usually. And so when you, what time is convenient to use for the time when you start timing? Zero. So we just set time initial to zero. And then solve this for X final and we say X final is equal to X initial plus V average T final. We get tired of saying finals. And so we drop those and we just say X, <laughs> come on, there we go. X is equal to X initial, that is your position is equal to the starting position, plus the average speed multiplied by the time that passed. So that is a kinematic equation. It's really the same kinematic equation as this right here. Now if I use this equation and substitute for V average. And that zero is the same as initial. Then I have X equals X initial plus V initial over two multiplied by T plus the V final over two multiplied by T. Well, that's useful except for usually we only have the initial conditions. We don't have the final conditions. We're looking for the final conditions. So then I will come back and look at this equation. If I solve that for speed, that will give me Why didn't I put A average? Because it's constant acceleration. So if acceleration is constant, there's no reason to specify average. So V minus V initial equals A T or V equals V initial plus A T. And I can substitute this into there. And then I'll have an equation that has position in terms of just the initial conditions. So if I put that in, so for V, I'm putting in that substitution. Now notice I have V initial T over two plus V initial times T over two. V initial T over two plus V initial T over two. Those add together and you just get initial T. And then I have to look at the last term, A T times T over two. There's over two, one half. A T times T, we write as T squared. That is our most important of kinematic equations. About 90% of the time, if you're solving a kinematic problem,
problem, you're going to use that equation. Now, that's not a fixed number. It depends on the problems a teacher chooses. The problems a teacher chooses. But that is your go-to equation. It's the one you use the most. Then there's one final kinematic equation. That final kinematic equation is an elimination equation to eliminate time. Notice this equation, the last one we did, it has x position, v velocity, and a acceleration, nt time. has four variables. And of course, you have initial and final, which gives you a few more, but four fundamental properties. If you have a problem and you don't know the time and you don't care about the time, it's useful to have an equation that has time eliminated. And so to eliminate time, we simply come back and look for a kinematic equation that does not have, or that has time that we can solve and substitute out. And without going through the work of it, this is the equation you get if you eliminate time. The x minus x zero, that's the distance traveled, is equal to v squared minus v initial squared, the difference in the final speed squared and the initial speed squared, divided by two times the acceleration. I swear I wrote this wrong in the homework help. I'm going to have to go back and change that um, because I didn't do the work either there. So we have time eliminated here. So the kinematic equations, these here are what we will use to solve any kinematic equation problem. When would I use the first one? I would use the first one if I don't know the acceleration, I don't care about the acceleration, but I know the average speed. Like if you have a you know, situation where the average speed is in. Second one, if I don't know the position, I don't care about the position. The third one, if I have all the variables looking for you know, something. And the last one, if I don't have the time and don't care about the time. So when making a decision, when solving kinematic equation problems, you have to decide which equation am I going to use. And there's an easy way and a hard way. And I will point specifically to James. James worked out the homework before we ever talked about it. He did not make any mistake here. Otherwise, I wouldn't bring him out, right? <laughs> don't want to see anyone. But in solving a problem, um, the problem, oh, which one was it? I don't know. Oh, yeah, the problem with the runner, she finishes the race, she's traveling nine meters per second. She decelerates at one meter per second squared, or two meters per second squared, excuse me, for five seconds. The first thing you have to do there is find what her final position is. So in that problem, you are given the initial speed and the acceleration and the time, speed, acceleration, time, and you're looking for position. That includes all four of our variables. Which equation do you use if you're including all four variables? Use, well, the longest one. It's the third one on this table. So you use that one. You just put in her final position. What's her initial position? Well, we're going to say she, we're measuring how far she traveled from where she was at the beginning time. So we'll put initial position zero. So we put in zero for the initial position, her initial speed, nine meters per second, the time, five seconds, the acceleration, minus two meters per second squared, time squared, that's going to be five seconds squared, and you put it through and you get a distance. And you feel really good, well, you should feel good about yourself. You solve the problem. Now, going to the second part, James said, well, now I know both the initial and ending distances, and I was given the acceleration, I was given the initial speed, so I can use the bottom equation to find the final speed. And he did that, and he calculated correctly, and he got the answer wrong. What was the difficulty, anyone besides James, because obviously we talked through, what was the difficulty, how did he get the answer wrong by doing the math right? If it was positive or negative? If it's positive or negative, he solved specifically for v squared. And so as anyone who knows a little math, he square rooted the number. But when you square root a number, there are two possible answers. You have a, pos a positive answer and a negative answer. And that equation simply doesn't tell you which one it is. 
Now, the other way to solve it would be to use the second equation up there. The speed is the initial speed plus acceleration multiplied by time. It turns out that's the simpler way of doing it. And the benefit of doing it that way is it will give you a positive if it's positive. It will give you a negative if it's negative. So let's look at kinematic type problems. First, we have to pay attention to directions. A student came to me this morning asking about a reading quiz question involving the value g. We use g, a lowercase g, for the acceleration of gravity. And if it's written without a vector sign, if you just write g without a vector sign, that's defined as 9.80 meters per second squared. Why is there no direction? Okay, we do know it's down. But this is not a vector. If it's just g and not g vector, then it's going to be a positive magnitude. It's just a scalar, doesn't have a sign to it. So the constant g is positive. Now we define the direction down as the direction the g vector points. And so if I have g vector, g vector is going to be pointing down. So g vector would be either nine point eight zero meters per second squared down, or minus nine point eight zero meters per second squared up, because up is minus down. So either one of those is a correct specification for the g vector. And notice I can replace 9.80 meters per second squared with the g constant. So it's either g down or minus g up. So g vector is minus g up. Sounds funny, right? But that question was given as one of your possible reading quiz questions to make sure that you're thinking about the directions. So in this problem, we once again have the conventions that we talked about. Our convention is that up will be the positive direction. And so the acceleration is down. The acceleration is a negative value because up is positive. So downward acceleration is a negative acceleration. Now in this picture, it shows a gentleman and this gentleman is throwing the ball and we're calling the height of the ball when it leaves his hand zero height and it leaves his hand at initial speed of 13 meters per second and the problem actually asks how long is going to take until it's 8.10 meters above where he released it actually i think it says at x amount of, at one second is here and two seconds there but we'll, we'll see we'll problems on the next page or next slide and we go through, we can find all kinds of things, which we will do. In problems like this, let us suppose the problem asks us, what is the maximum height achieved by the ball? We have to have a strategy to solve that. And so we have to think, okay, what is the maximum height? Now, if I'm going to use calculus, I can take my equation for x, take the derivative, set the derivative equal to zero, and say that's going to be either the min or max. That would be a lot of extra work, but it's actually, in practice, what we do. We just do it in a lot simpler fashion. What can you tell me definitively is a value between position, um, position and velocity and acceleration when it's at its peak in motion? I throw something up, gets to the peak, comes back down. What can you tell me you know exactly the value when it's at its peak. Okay, the velocity is zero. There is another answer, and that could be the acceleration is constant. The problem is the acceleration is constant throughout the flight. And so that one doesn't help me. It's true. But it's not the one I was looking for. The one I was looking for was the velocity is zero. And so if I want to find the maximum height, I would probably say, okay, I know the velocity is zero. Oh, excellent. The velocity is zero at the maximum height. And it didn't ask me what time, just asked what is the position. And so I'd use this equation that doesn't have time. 
and just put in zero for the final velocity and calculate it. Now let's do some problems. From here on out, it's just going to be problems and how to solve problems for today, obviously not for the rest of the year. So question number one, what is the maximum height? So break up just in groups of your table and between the three or two people at your table, work out what the maximum height is going to be for, well, And when your table thinks you have the problem done, raise your hand so I just keep track of the progress. Is that the initial? Yes, yes, VY initial is zero. I, why for the first group? Um, I why well, everything just a trip yeah, because it's vertical, I use Y as my variable instead of X, but it's exactly the same equations. Yeah, just the first one. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, so since they were the first group done, Ed is going to kindly illustrate and explain how they did it. Come on up, use the pen, use your, <clears throat> your teaching voice. My teaching voice. Try not to actually press any buttons on the pen. Ready. So uh, I like the 90% equation, not the one that eliminates time. So that's <laughs> the one I used. Uh, so first you have to find time. I don't know how to use this. Just like a normal just pen. Just like a normal pen, yeah. Okay. Can I put my hand on it? You can. Okay. So first thing is I did is I found. Now notice he used units. I like that. When I work out the problems, I always put in the units because like many of you are going to take the MCAT at some point. And there are some problems where it'll just be all the numbers are the same and the units are different. If you pay attention to the units as you go through, you can see how the units come out in the end. So this was just to find time, uh, and then we came out with, oops, came out with 1.33 seconds, and then we went ahead and plugged it into the uh, the 90 percent equation, if you want to call it that. <laughs> Now it didn't put units after I pointed it out. Yeah. It's fine because we're low on time. So. Okay. Thank you. How many people got his answer? Excellent. Only a group or two that didn't. How many people solved it his way? <laughs> just his group is it wrong that they solved it that way no it's not when it comes to the test you have those five, pro five problems where you have to explain how you're going to solve it show how you solve it you don't have to solve it the same way i do as long as it's a correct way okay i'm going to end with this slide problem solving techniques first thing to do is to draw a figure on the test on those five problems that figure is going to be worth two points just showing that you understand the physical thing that's going on, because this is physics, say the physical world. In this case, the problem was already 
illustrate for you, you didn't need a new figure. Then make a list of what is known and what is unknown. So you notice that I gave you the knowns right here. I didn't write down the unknown, but I gave you the knowns there because that helps you to organize your thinking. Um, then you know, specify what needs to be determined the problem. So in this case, you would have said, well, I'm looking for the maximum height. Find an equation or set of equations that can help you solve the problem and write those down. And that's another 20% of your grade is just writing down, this is the equation I'm going to use. I always want to see the equation before you put the numbers in. Given time, I'm happy that he did just because there wasn't much time. So I know, yeah, that's what they're doing, not something random. Then you put in your numbers and calculate. And finally, check to make sure the answer is reasonable. I had a student come by this morning. The student had the answer right, but they didn't think it was reasonable. So they came to check with me to make sure it was reasonable. And that's perfectly good. Of course, on the test, you don't get that.